Hello, this is Dr. Kat Fleece from Central New Mexico Community College. We're going to continue with the brain, and I'm going to call this video Brain Part 1, two, uh, B, I should say, indicating that this is our second lecture on the brain. So remember last time I introduced you to the four major parts of the brain. Remember they are the cerebrum, the biggest part, which we can also refer to as the cerebral hemisphere, so you guys need to look at your slides and keep up with this. The second part is going to be the diencephalon, then we'll take a look at the brainstem, and finally we'll look at the cerebellum, all right? So those are your four major parts, and as I explained last time, each one of those parts always has three subparts. And last time we started to look at the cerebrum, and we learned that the three subparts from most superficial to deeper are the cerebral cortex, followed by the white matter, and then followed by something we call the basal nuclei, sometimes called the basal ganglia. Uh, I prefer to call them the basal nuclei, and that will explain better why. So we had already introduced you to the major functions of the cerebral cortex. It's that very thin, convoluted outer layer of the cerebrum, and it's made up of what we refer to as gray matter. We learned about the difference between white matter and gray matter last time as well. So if we look at this slide, slide 15, where we're starting out with titled the cerebral cortex, then <clears throat> we're now focusing in on a portion of that very convoluted um, cerebral cortex that's made up of gray matter, meaning that it's mostly cell bodies with some unmyelinated fibers. And so there are two major parts for us to focus on. And again, give me just a second here, see if I can enlarge this. That's the wrong button to push. Um, so if we take a look at that very convoluted layer, then we see that there are two major structures that you need to become familiar with, and that is sulcus, which is the invagination, right? And then the little bump we call the gyrus. And so the plural for sulcus would be sulci, kind of like nu nucleus, not nuclei, or sulci, if you want to say it that way. And what would it be for gyrus? Gyri or gyri, correct. Sometimes we have a very deep invagination, and then we'll refer to that as a fissure. So we'll take a look at two major fissures. Remember, fissures are very deep invaginations. You can almost think of them as a very deep sulcus. So we'll, we'll take a look at where they are in the cerebral cortex. But first, let's point out the five pairs of lobes that make up the cerebral cortex. And the names of them are pretty easy because they correspond to the major skull bones that you learn about, right? Remember, you learn about the frontal and the parietal and temporal and occipital skull bones, and then there is one pair of lobes called the insular lobes that have a more unique name, and they're located very deep within um, the cerebrum. Remember how your brain had to fold up to fit in the skull? So some of the cerebral cortex is actually folded inward, um, sort of deeper to what we can see superficially now. One of the things that students have missed very often in the past is the, the fact that there are five pairs of lobes. So don't forget that we have the insular lobes. And I'll point out where they are in just a moment. Let's just start with the obvious ones. So we have here our frontal lobes in the red. Well, we see only one of those because we're only looking at uh, the side view of the brain. Then we have here the temporal lobe. We have our parietal lobe and then our occipital lobe right there in the green. Don't forget that this beige structure is not part of the cerebrum. That is going to be the cerebellum. And then this structure here, the most inferior that continues with the spinal cord, is the brain stem. Right? Notice, too, that each one of these lobes has some major functions associated with it. We will focus in more detail on these functions, but it's probably already a good idea for me to point out some of these things. So many of the motor responses, remember motor responses means that commands in the form of action potentials will leave the central nervous system and go to our muscles. That's what we refer to as motor responses. You know, you talk about your little baby developing motor skills, 
as in it starts to get better at walking and grabbing and holding on to things. So keep that in mind. That's what we mean by motor response. So many of those originate from the frontal lobes. Your parietal lobes are involved in something called somatosensation, re literally referring to the fact that that is where we receive um, information about the environment related to touch, for instance. Lots of touch information uh, arrives in, in these lobes, and, and, and more things we'll, we'll take a look at. Your temporal lobes um, are especially involved in hearing, but also memory. Occipital lobes definitely need to know that they're responsible for receiving information about sight, interpreting that as well. So the visual sensation is an important component of or function of the occipital lobes. And then we get to the insular lobes, and I'll again point them out on the next slide, but they're going to be dealing with sensation related to our vestibular area in the body and the viscera. The viscera, you know by now, those are your organs, especially in your thoracic cavity and in your abdominal pelvic cavity, whether it's your lungs, your hearts, your, your hearts, you have one heart, right? Um, your stomach, intestines, bladder, those we refer to as the viscera. But what do we mean by vestibular? Does anybody know what that refers to? I cannot hear you. No, that would be vestigial. So don't confuse vestibular with vestigial. Vestibular refers to equilibrium or balance. And you know, your, your, your ears, which are one of your special sensory organs, they're not just involved in, in detecting hearing or dealing with hearing. They're also involved in balance. So your, your ears have a dual function. Don't ever forget that. We all tend to forget how important our ears um, are because they have two major functions. So now here on slide 17, we can actually see how deeply located that insular lobe is. So notice that we've taken out a big chunk of the brain's cerebral hemisphere here to the point that we even see some of the white matter. And then deep in there, we see a, a, a bunch of um, crinkly stuff, and that is the insular lobe. And of course, we have one on either side. So you have to look deep within. And once again, that is due to the fact to uh, or it results from the fact that your brain has to fold up so much as it develops, just like we studied last time, right? Remember, it started out as this tube, this neural tube. Remember how we learned about all that? And then it started to create those primary vesicles and secondary vesicles. And then ultimately, they got so big that they might not fit in the skull. And so they had to fold upon themselves and also get very crinkly. Okay, I mentioned earlier that a very deep sulcus is called a, a fissure. So what we find in between your two cerebral hemispheres is what we call the longitudinal fissure. So right here, this is the longitudinal fissure. It separates your two cerebral hemispheres. And we'll have a second major fissure that separates the cerebrum and cerebellum. Here then we see that transverse fissure between the cerebrum and the cerebellum. This slide also shows some of the major sulci that you're responsible for. So let's take a look at these. So we have a so-called central sulcus, which we'll use as a major landmark, as you'll see in the next few slides. And the central sulcus separates the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. You also have a lateral sulcus, which follows the contour, the superior contour of the uh, temporal lobe. And then the final sulcus you need to be aware of is the parieto-occipital lobe, and its name, of course, clearly tells you where it is located. Okay, you've heard of, of people talking about their one side of their brain being dominant over the other side, or cerebral dominance, or um, you might hear people talk about uh, my left brain, I'm a left brainer or, or I'm a right brainer. Ever heard people talk about that? 
there's a little bit of truth to that. For one, we tend to talk about the part of the brain that is the hemisphere that contains our language areas, and we'll learn what they are. We tend to consider that part of your brain, whether it's in the left side or the right side, to be your more dominant part of your brain. Um, in most of us, our language areas are located in the left side of the brain, in the left hemisphere. So in that sense, we can talk about cerebral dominance. We do know, though, that even for those language areas to operate, they still need input from the right side of the brain. So if there is true lateralization, if there is true cerebral dominance, it kind of depends on whom you talk with, and we're not 100% sure if we really should be looking at the brain like that. So just a little bit of uh, food for thought for you to ponder through. This is not something I will easily you know, test you on, as in what part of the, the brain is the most dominant. It is a good thing for you to know that your language areas are typically, in most of us, located in the left cerebral hemisphere. Not in all of us, but in most of us. And remember what that word means, lateralization. Lateral refers to side. So lateralization referring to the fact that one side or one hemisphere may have more um, functions than the other or more unique functions or has just unique functions that the other one doesn't have. I'd like for you to read something in your book called The Myth of the Left Versus the Right Brain. So look for that, all right? So talking about that, so I just said that there is some thought that there is some lateralization in the brain, but at the same time, we know that almost all functions in the brain require both sides. And so we're going to kind of approach the brain with the fact that we can point to an area and then say this particular area corresponds to this particular function. That's the way I'm going to teach you the brain, but I'm going to repeat myself. You need to always keep in the back of your mind that despite the fact that I'll point to an area and I say, I'll say these are the major functions, most often that area will still get help from other areas in the brain, and sometimes even from the other side of the brain. So keep that in mind. But, you know, for us to go into great detail on the brain is well beyond the scope of this class. You know, we're just going to sort of touch the tip of the iceberg here. So, that said, um, back in the early 1900s, a guy very interested in the brain by the name of Brodman, he came up with these functional areas, a total of 52 of them, which is kind of impressive. So, he spent a lot of time... Um, studying the brain in the ways that they could at that time, and again, I don't want to go into those details, but so this has led us to, to recognizing three major functional areas. We have the so-called primary sensory areas, the primary motor areas, and I think they speak for themselves what they do. And then finally, we have so-called association areas. So the association areas, they literally associate the input from the sensory areas with the output of the motor areas. In other words, when sensory information enters the brain, these association areas interpret that, they process, they edit, they make decisions, and they make sure that the right motor areas of the brain are going to send out the commands to the effectors. Remember what the effectors are? Muscles and glands, right? We have primarily been focusing on skeletal muscles, and so you could at this point in time still think that way, but as you move into AMP2, don't forget your heart muscle, your smooth muscle, your glands, those are effectors as well. Now when, you're, when we're going to move on to the next slides with all the pictures, and if you pick up different books and you're studying with tutorials I have linked to your to-dos, or any fun website that you might discover, typically we're going to see that areas that are considered primary should start with the word primary. Unfortunately, we'll see in some of your slides coming up that's not always the case, and I'll try to 
uh, remind you of that. So association areas should not have the word primary in them. All right, so association areas will not have the word primary in them. Keep that in mind. So let's take a look at some examples of sensory motor and association areas in, in the brain. For instance, and here we're already seeing that some of them are not listing primary, so I'm going to fix that. So for instance, in the, in the occipital lobe, and which color is the occipital lobe here? Can you recognize what's anterior versus posterior? It's a little hard sometimes when you are just learning. So this, let me indicate what is anterior. So this is anterior right here, you guys, because this is your lateral sulcus here. All right, so this is P4 posterior. And so the green area exactly is your, um, is your occipital lobe. And there we find the primary cortex. So this should say primary visual cortex. Uh, we also have in the, in the temporal lobe, the yellow area there, the primary auditory cortex. So they should have primary in front of them. You can see that it also says here in the um, parietal lobe, the primary sensory cortex. I prefer to call it the primary somatosensory cortex. So you may want to add somato to that. We see a primary motor cortex in the frontal area, right? So your sensory areas receive information, your motor areas are going to send out information. Let's go back to the occipital lobe because there we have a so-called visual association area. So in the occipital lobe, that's where action potentials arrive from the eye. You know, you can all see me because images are sent into your, or I should say light signals are sent into that occip occipital lobe via the optic nerve, right? And then the association area literally makes sense out of that information so that you understand that what you're looking at is me, your instructor who's talking to you, who looks tall and has short hair, all that stuff. You know, there's a difference between being, you being able to see and you being able to interpret what you see. You see the difference there? So that's what association areas do. They allow you to understand and interpret what you see. Do you see the difference between the function of your primary visual cortex versus your visual association cortex or area? Everybody? No? Yes? Okay. So again, just as a reminder, what, what do we mean by sensory information versus motor information? So if we focus on sensory input for a moment, you know, we're, we're back to this slide that we've seen at least twice already, and that tells you how important it is for you to understand how information flows in the body. So you're, we're coming back to our faucet here with perhaps hot water coming out. You have in your fingertips these, the receptors, which are really the beginnings, the dendrites of sensory receptors. Uh, touching the hot water, and so action potentials will fly down the axon of, that is present in your hand, up the arm, all the way up the spinal cord, and then here we're starting to see uh, a synapsis as we're slowly but surely entering the brain, and inside of the brain we have another synapsis, and then finally we make it to the cortex, all right? So that would be that primary somatosensory area, meaning a sensory area that can receive stimuli from the skin, for instance, your skeletal muscles, your bones. So when we talk somatosensory information, we're referring to information coming from your skin, your skeletal muscles, your bones, things like your tendons and ligaments. So not your viscera, you guys. All right, so that would be different. So this is where the information arrives. We'll talk about um, motor information in just a little bit. 
So that's what we're looking at here is that most of our sensory information actually arrives in the occipital lobe, such as visual, right? Temporal for hearing, and for pari the parietal lobes are especially involved in somato sensory information. So if we look at this cut of the brain here, you guys, what kind of a cut is that? Ooh, all of you need to know that. Is it a sagittal cut? It's not sagittal. We've been looking at sagittal cut. Well, not exactly. We've looked at the side of the brain, but this is a coronal or frontal cut. It's a cut like this, right? Where you basically put a crown on a person's head and um, slice it that way. You guys follow that? So this is a cerebral hemisphere here. And this is one. So therefore, this here is that very good, that longitudinal fissure, exactly. And you can see all the little crinkles of the cerebral cortex. And notice how far in they go along that longitudinal fissure, right? And again here, this is about where we would find that insular lobe. OK. So our, let's continue our discussion of sensory input with a, an emphasis on the primary somatosensory area of the cortex. Remember, this is the area located in the parietal lobe that is right at the start of the parietal lobe. So remember how your frontal lobe meets your parietal lobe and that you have a sulcus there. So right posterior that sulcus is a gyrus that we'll refer to as the post-central gyrus. So this is in the parietal lobe. And that's where we have this region located we call the primary somatosensory cortex. As it says here, information arises from skin skeletal muscles, joints, bones, like your, your periosteum, your ligaments, those kinds of structures sent their information in there. Now, what's interesting is that in this particular area, we can literally draw a little human being. See that here? More or less, right? So it shows us that particular parts of that cortical area, remember cortical is the adjective for cortex, correspond to receiving sensory information from that part of the body, right? We're looking at sensory input. And when we can draw a little human being like that, by the way, we call it a homunculus. And since we're focusing on sensory information, we'll call it a sensory homunculus. So when you look at the different sizes of the parts of the, the body, let's all do that. Whoa, big hand, right? Big lips, big tongue. What does that tell you? Right, we're much more sens sensitive, right? Meaning there's a lot of sensory information arriving in the brain from your hand and fingers, from your eyes as well, right? From your lips, from your tongue, and that makes sense, right? Those areas are very sensitive. So another interesting thing is that we are, well, we just mentioned that some areas are much more sensitive, meaning they have many more sensory receptors, obviously, that then allow for information to make it into the brain. And that leads us to something we refer to as spatial discrimination. So if you were to put two pins really close together on your lips, you would be able to distinguish between those two points on your lips, right? Now, Keep that same distance and, and have somebody put those two points with the same distance on your back and you'll probably just feel it like one poke. So your back is much less sensitive as this picture shows too, right? Look at how much is it devoted to the torso. Not all that much compared to your lips, for instance, considering the sizes of these two structures in our body. So we refer to that as spatial discrimination, meaning how well can you de de detect or differentiate between two points um, where you're stimulated. And then finally, the word somatotopy will keep popping up, not just in the brain, but even in the spinal cord. And it, 
a simple way of, of explaining it to you is by saying that our whole brain is laid out pretty logically compared to how our body is arranged. In other words, neurons that bring information in from the feet are not going to sit right next to information that's coming in from, from the lips, right? That would be too much of a mix of information coming in. So we have a pretty nice layout in the brain, which creates, therefore, an image that almost looks like a human being when we, when we map the brain. So that we call somatotopy. Let's analyze that word. Remember, we always learn the roots of words so that down the road you can still translate them. What does soma mean? Body, very good. And topi, can you think of a word that starts with tope? What's that? Topography, very good. And that's exactly this. We're making a map of the body, topography, right? A topographical map of the body. Good job. So which primary area did we just focus on? We focused on the primary, what was it called? Somatosensory area, right? We're still focusing on just sensory input. Let's now list the other major sensory areas. And if you know your special senses, this is going to be pretty simple with the addition of maybe a couple more. So what are your primary sensory or primary senses? Your, your, I'm sorry, your special senses, that's what I meant to say. What are your five special senses? Excluding touch, touch is not a special sense. Sight, see, smell, yeah, seeing, smelling, taste, hearing. hearing, and equilibrium. Very good, that's your fifth one. All your special senses are processed where? In special sensory organs. And where are all of them located? In your head, not in your brain, but around your brain. Very good, right? Your ear, your tongue, and the rest of your mouth with its taste receptors, your eyes. And where is balance processed? Again, in your ears. And what did I just miss? Is that them? So we, we have four special sensory organs, but we have five, what? Special senses. So touch is not considered a special sense. Touch is, is detected you know, throughout the body, but it requires a much simple kind of receptor. Special sensory receptors that are part of your special sensory organs are more complex. We'll learn more about that later. But anyway, why did I bring up your special senses? Well, that allows you to then remember your primary sensory areas. Right? If you know your special senses and you remember that touch is dealt with with the primary somatosensory area, that leaves us with a primary visual area, a primary auditory area, right? A primary vestibular area, what am I forgetting? Taste. A primary gustatory area. Gustatory, as you'll see spelled on the next slide, refers to taste. All right? So, Rather than me going over where these are all located, I'm going to have you work yourself with your um, images. And remember that some of your images do not always include the term primary. For instance, here this should say primary auditory cortex, right? And primary visual cortex, etc. Ooh, I did forget another one smell. So there's your primary olfactory which is somewhat located in your temporal lobes, and then your primary gustatory. Notice that, remember gustatory as in, in how do you say, to taste in Spanish? Me gusto, right? That means I like it, right? So gustare, gustare, gustare in Latin means to taste, so gustatory means taste. So notice that this is an example of a special sense that is or received in that insular lobe. Can we see the insular lobe on this picture? No. All right, so that wraps up our discussion of sensory information. Have we left discussing the cerebral cortex yet? No. 
We've been talking about the cerebral cortex the whole time. What is the cerebral cortex? That thin layer of gray matter that forms the sulky and the gyri and here and there a fissure, right? That very, it's, it's, it's a tenth of an inch or so thick uh, that, you know, has a, a huge surface area. The fact that we're still talking about it tells you what? Important. Very important, has many functions, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's one of the most well-developed parts of our brain in us humans. It's probably setting us apart from all the other animals. Okay, so we're going to set aside sensory input. We're going to take a look now at which areas of the cerebral cortex send information out to the body, right? So we're looking at motor output now. We'll start out with the primary motor cortex. And if we take a look at, I always need three-dimensional images, you guys, and, and some of the images, for instance, right up here, for those of you who are like me and can't think three-dimensionally, this image at the, up in the upper right here doesn't look like much, but if you follow the link, that image will rotate, all right? And then you can better visualize all these colored areas on the static pictures. I constantly need to look at a rotating brain because I, I, my 3D mind is pathetic. I hate to admit it, um, but I'm not a very good 3D thinker. And I think some of you aren't either, and others, you're probably really great at it. So depending on what you need, you know, use my resources. So even though I'm not going to show a rotating image here, this image here is, is at least showing us a bit of a three-dimensional view. So we have our th two hemispheres here, right? Here's our right cerebral hemisphere. Here's our left cerebral hemisphere. Don't forget what is anterior versus posterior. This is anterior. This is posterior. You can always cheat and look at where the cerebellum is, or you can look at where that lateral sulcus is. That should help you figure out where is anterior and posterior. So we, we focused on an area uh, just earlier called the primary somatosensory area. And for that, we need to locate that central sulcus, right? Here's your central sulcus or there. And this purple area is what we already studied. And what was located in that post-central gyrus? Does anybody remember? Your primary somatosensory area. So notice that on the other side of that sulcus, this time in the frontal lobe, in the green area, so now we're already in the frontal lobe, we're now looking at the primary motor area. So we have a motor area right next door to a sensory area, separated by that major sulcus we call the central sulcus. Is everybody following that? Good. So what do the neurons do that start in that primary motor cortex in the pre-central central gyrus, so not in the post, but in the pre-central gyrus? Well, these are neurons that are going to dive into the spinal cord, and then from the spinal cord, we're going to see that somatic motor neurons leave. You know what somatic motor neurons are, right? What do they do? They go, they go where? What do somatic motor neurons do? Okay, every one of you needs to know that if you're still here today. They go, they innervate skeletal muscles. All of you, write this down in huge letters so you never forget that, all right? Or you're going to be pretty lost for your final exam in an AMP2. So again, we're looking at the primary motor cortex. From there, neurons Go, leave the brain, typically go down into the spinal cord, and there they will synapse with the cell body of a somatic motor neuron. And that somatic motor neuron can then control skeletal muscles, right? Now, sometimes they don't have to go into the spinal cord if they, for instance, need to control eye muscles, skeletal muscles that move your eyes, right? Now, in order for this part of the brain to know what to do exactly, um, they're not just going to depend on information coming in from the um, sensory areas. Um, there's also other parts of the brain that typically help out, including the cerebellum, as I'll explain later on. But we can now, and I don't have a picture of this, 
but we can also draw a motor homunculus on the motor cortex. Remember we looked at the sensory homun homunculus earlier? We could do something similar for the primary motor area, all right? So you could draw a little human being there as well. And basically what we're going to see is that we're going to see that those areas that, it, which, which parts of your body, which skeletal muscles in your body, or which, wait, let me rephrase that. Which parts of your body contain skeletal muscles that need to create very specific movements? Your fingers especially, right? Your fingers on your hands, right? Even your eyes, things like that. And so therefore, even your mouth as I list here, right, with your tongue, you need to be able to be in good control of those so you can have good speech. So those are going to be, once again, areas that will get, if you draw the homunculus, will be big in structure, right? If we compare that to your thigh muscles, do they need to be... Do they need to have skeletal muscles that can control very specific, meticulous, fine-tuned movements? Not really. Kick a ball and that's good enough, right? Back to our picture. I know you're probably sick of it, but that's a good sign. When you're starting to get sick of things, that's a good sign. So we're dealing with motor responses. And remember, most of your motor responses, they're controlled by your frontal lobe. So that primary motor cortex area that we were just looking at, remember it sits anterior to the central sulcus. That means we're in the frontal lobe. Don't lose track of where we are. So earlier, we learned about sensory information doing this, up the spinal cord into the brain to the post-central area. Um, and then we're going to see that um, neurons will la leave the primary motor cortex as follows, down the brain, out the spinal cord, back to your hand, so you can pull back your hand as the water is hot. Yes? Okay, now we get to the more complex areas, which are these association areas. And remember, association areas are your are third functional area. You have sensory areas you have motor areas. And the association areas are the ones that um, integrate a lot of the information, particularly from the sensory information, to make decisions. But they also, uh, you know, tap into the motor areas. It gets rather complex. And it allows us to do very complex things. For one, for one I mentioned earlier, um, these the visual association area allows you to interpret what you see. It also allows you to interpret motion when, some, when an, an object or an animal or I am moving. It, it's pretty complex what we can do with our brain and the images that arrive. And then these very uh, much higher processes that we do as humans and that is analyze and process and plan ahead and, and you know, uh, pull together information from here and there and make a decision. Um, even to some extent, language and speech um, relate to association areas. So association areas are very well developed in us. And, and of course, in some of the uh, animals like the greater apes, uh, they're pretty well developed too. So as mentioned earlier, typically association areas do not start with the term primary but my pictures are not always exact, so I'm going to make the correction one more time. So we have primary visual cortex, primary auditory cortex. We already have primary sensory or somatosensory cortex, primary motor cortex. What else? So, yep, that's pretty good. So I fixed some of the ones that weren't quite... Uh, accurate and then all the other ones are clearly marked are either clearly marked as association area the ones that are labeled here or they do not have the term primary in front of them so in other words you can assume that wernick's area is an association area so is broca's area so is the prefrontal cortex okay just to give you a few examples so each one of your primary sensory areas is going to have, and, and motor areas, is, is actually going to have um, an association area. Let's take a look at the sensory association areas. We already talked a little bit 
about the visual association area, you can probably apply that knowledge for the auditory association area. I want to say a few more words about the somatosensory association area. And I always like to give the following example. So, for instance, I love eating um, gummy bears, and they're very dangerous. I can't have them lying around in my house, but they are right now, as a matter of fact. So, um, you know, suppose that I, I grabbed a bunch, put them in my pocket as I went for a walk with my dog, and I didn't eat all of them. That would be rare, but let's suppose so. And I come to class, and I put my hand in my pocket, you know, I wouldn't have to look to see what, what I'm feeling, right? I would, I would be able to feel the texture, I would feel the shape, I would feel the size, you know, and, and I would put all of that together, and remember I walked yesterday, all of that tells me, oh, these are my gummy bears, and now I get to eat those after lecture, right? So that's what these somatosensory uh, association areas can do. They, they manage to interpret size, texture, etc., cetera, and, and make the connections for us to interpret exactly what we're feeling. And again, try to do the same thing with all of these other association areas. You know, the, the reason for why you understand, or the reason why you hear and then understand what I'm saying is because you have learned from the past how to associate certain sounds with certain meanings, right? It, take, it took you a long time. I mean, that's why you're still in college. You're still learning. You're still training your auditory association areas. In addition to sensory association areas, we also have motor association areas. And there's many. We'll just point out a couple there's one that sits right in front of the primary motor area. So let's do a quick review here, you guys. So here's our cerebrum, and here is our central sulcus. So posterior to the central sulcus in that post-central gyrus, that is our primary somatosensory area, right? Anterior to it, however, we have the pre-central gyrus, and what do we have there? Because I know you can't read that, so I'm asking you, what is this hot pink area? That's your primary motor area. Very good. So we've already studied that. The ones with the lighter colors, whether they're blue, lighter blue or lighter um, red, indicate that they're um, association areas. They're still related to those either motor or primary areas, motor or primary sensory, but they're more um, association areas. And the more we deviate from the color, except for the green then, um, the more complex the association area is. So close by the primary motor cortex in the hot pink, we have in the lighter pink area something we refer to as the somatic motor association area. So it tells you that is the association area for the primary motor area. I often call it the premotor cortex. So be sure you know both terms so that you don't get confused. And so this is where we, this is the part of the brain we tap into when we do a lot of repetitive movements. For instance, when you're uh, playing piano um, or playing an instrument, you know, where you do a lot of movements you, you learn and drilled and they're very repetitive movements. Probably even a lot of the movement, movements I do when I'm dancing with, with, you know, ballroom dancing or swing dancing or country western dancing, whatever dancing one does, especially with a partner, you learn to follow certain leads and they tend to be rather repetitive or very similar. So you've learned to do that with the help of this particular association area. Um, you know, this is also the area that supposedly lights up. I don't know if you guys watched some of the skating this weekend, but you know, the skaters are always off on the side, sort of in their own little world, pacing back and forth, right? What are they doing when they're doing that? Or dancers? The they're going through the routine or gymnasts you've seen gymnasts doing that so when they're just going through the routine in their heads this area actually lights up so despite the fact that they're not physically doing it but just thinking about it you know step by step by step um, that is already enough to get this part of the brain activated 
Broca's area is one of the language areas that you need to really know, you guys, or be aware of. So this is one of two language areas that we typically see in the left hemisphere only. Typically. We're not all the same. Some of us have areas totally flip-flop between right and left. Some of us have it more distributed between the hemispheres. But the majority have our language areas in the left cerebral hemisphere, in the left cortex. Um, and we'll find one more. So Broca's area is a motor association area. So it is involved with <clears throat> controlling um, motor output, skeletal muscles in particular, that control your tongue so that you can actually have good speech. Right? So my Broca's area is very active right now as I have to twist and turn my tongue in ways so that you can sort of understand what I'm saying. Some association areas are quite complex, and so we're, they're sometimes put in their own class of multimodal association areas. These areas collect information from several uh, primary sensory cortical areas. And the two that I'd like for you to know are Wernick's area, located right next door to the primary auditory cortex. Remember, this should say primary in front of this. And also, also partially located in the parietal lobe. Wernick's area is another language area. Together with Broca's area, it belongs to the language areas. And it's, it's located in the left um, cerebral hemisphere, in the cere left cerebral cortex area. So this is one of those language areas that we typically find in the left side of the brain. And because of these areas, we tend to refer to the left side of the brain as the dominant part of the brain. Um, again, these language areas are not always locate, located on the left side in everybody's brain. I am going to talk a little bit more about an other multimodal association area. Um, and that is called the prefrontal cortex. Notice that it sits, sits very anteriorly in that uh, frontal lobe. And it sits nearby these other motor areas, the primary motor cortex, and also then this association area, which is directly connected to the primary motor cortex. So the prefrontal cortex, you guys, is the multimodal association area I do need you to know some more details about. So you guys can read a little bit more about Wernick's area. Uh, I didn't record everything that we just discussed. Um, it's a pretty complex language area that really impacts how well we understand speech and how well we can speak as well together with Broca's area. But pre the prefrontal cortex I'd like to spend some time on this is the, the cortex, as, as a, if you look at the previous slide, that's located in the most anterior portion of the frontal lobe. And if this is damaged, it totally changes our personality. So this is a lobe, you know, if we have a high impact accident with a car, for instance, that can really do a number on us. So this is the part of your brain where we... Um, we do a lot of recalling, but also um, this is where your personality develops. This is where we, um, this is a part of the brain that allows us to be attentive and stay focused um, and be a, a good human being. As in, this is the part of your brain that allows you to, to keep the good from the bad, to make decisions about the good and the bad. Uh, this is the part of the brain where you, um, can be moral. Again, this differentiating the good from the bad. Um, the, sa the same from different, as I, I write on there on that slide as well. It's also that part of the brain where you do so much planning to where you can reach a specific goal. So lots of planning to reach a particular uh, goal. And this is a the first time I will mention a part of the brain that we will not really get to until you have taken this, this third exam. It's called the limbic system, but I would like for you to already know that 
Another way of referring to the limbic system is to call it our emotional brain. Or I'll say it's an emotional brain region because it's not just one structure. So your personality and your consciousness, they really depend a lot on this part of the brain called the emotional brain. Okay, so with this little bit of information given to you, it makes sense that teenagers, which some of you still are, are not as wise as I am. Well, what I'm saying here is that it takes quite a while for your brain, this particular part, the prefrontal cortex, to finish developing. You're well, well into your 20s, maybe pushing 30s, before this part of your brain has finished developing. And remember, this is where you can differentiate between the good and the bad. This is where you can look into the future, or not, I should say, you can look at a, a situation and go, oh, assuming it has finished developing, oh, I learned from the past that if I see this and that and that, that I better not do this, right? Um, and so as teenagers, you just don't have enough of that experience yet. And also, you just don't have this part of your brain very well developed yet. And consequently, teenagers make lots of mistakes. I was a teenager too, by the way. So I'm not trying to say it's just you guys or any of you here. And um, decisions are made that are very risky very often as teenagers. Let me finish that and I'll answer your question. This is also the part of the brain that very much depends on the environment, right? So, um, you know, we often ask ourselves, why did this person do all these criminal activities? And, and very often then when we look at how they were raised, it can address some of these dilemmas that this person is experiencing. That person wasn't raised in a social environment that taught him or her the good from the bad. Do you see what I'm trying to say here? Um, yeah, I'll stop it here for a second. There is a section in your book that's kind of interesting, and you'll hear this person's name throughout the time that you learn about the brain, whether it's in a psychology class uh, or maybe even in a nursing class or whatever field you're going in. And his name is Phineas Gage. I may not pronounce that first name well. But he had a major work accident back in the old days. I forgot whether it was some kind of a mining accident. But a, a huge stick went through his brain and he survived it. And yeah, read about it. You'll see what they talk about. So that's also discussed in your, brain, uh, in your book. It's a, a short section. So that wraps up the cerebral cortex, you guys. So we spend all of today's lecture and part of last lecture on it. So it's a very important part of your brain. It's the outer layer, the very convoluted layer of the cerebrum. It's made up of gray matter. And the fact that it's made up of gray matter tells you that it's just jam-packed with what? Unmyelinated fibers, but jam-packed really with what? Cell bodies. Right, gray matter, cell bodies, gray matter, cell bodies, gray matter, cell bodies with some unmyelinated fibers. You need to get that. And if you have lots of cell bodies, that means that lots of synapses are occurring, lots of integration of information. Um, you know, we often refer to, to the cerebral cortex and even some other parts of the brain, but especially the cerebral cortex as the the functions of the cerebral cortex is the higher brain functions, which many other animals do not have. Okay, so if we now poke our brain, or I should say our cerebrum, the cerebrum, the outer layer is the cerebral cortex, and then the next layer we come across is the cerebral white matter. And remember, white matter is made up of myelinated fibers only, right? Lots of myelinated axons. So I always think of the white matter, whether it's in the brain or in the spinal cord, as the freeway system of the CNS. Because if you have myelination, what does that mean? Fast, fast, fast propagation of action potentials, right? So I think of the white matter of, as the area of the brain and the spinal cord 
where we see action potentials is flying from left to right, up, down, whichever way they need to go. And so let's take a look in which direction all these axons travel. And depending on which directions they take, they get different names. So we have the three groups here. We have association fibers, projection fibers, and commissures. Association fibers are going to just interconnect parts of the same hemisphere. So we stay within the same hemisphere. We associate, you know, maybe the posterior part of your right hemisphere with the anterior portion of the right hemisphere. While your projection fibers are going to run very vertically. And so they're going to connect the, um, the brain with the spinal cord in particular, or the spinal cord with the brain. And then commissures interconnect your two hemispheres, whether it's in the brain or even in the spinal cord. Your spinal cord also has two hemispheres. So here we see an image illustrating some of this information I just gave you, particularly um, the projection fibers are nicely illustrated here. So once again, we're looking at a frontal section or a coronal section of the brain. Here's your longitudinal fissure. And we'll learn about these parts here deeper in the brain um, next time. But arising from the cortex, we see all of these fibers descending. There might even be some that are ascending. Um, but this, this fan of fibers is often referred to as the corona radiata. And again, fibers that run up and down between the spinal cord and the brain, we call projection fibers. Some of these fibers that start as the corona radiata are eventually going to form something we call the internal capsule. The internal capsule, we'll get to that, exactly what that is, but for now, keep in mind that that's a collection of projection fibers. Now, this is a nice image to focus on something we call decussation. And what does that word mean? Decussation literally means crossing over. So let's follow some of these fibers. So here I'm starting in one hemisphere and I trace it down, we're leaving the brain, we're entering the spinal cord, and notice that we now have reached the opposite side of the spinal cord. And from the spinal cord then, we'll see that neurons will leave to go innervate the body. So what is this telling you is that many fibers, they start on one side of the brain, maybe the right hemisphere, but where do they end up controlling the body? The opposite side, right? So, and that's due to the fact that our fibers crossed over. So the crossing over of the fibers we call decussation. And the fact that the fibers do cross over makes them contralateral. So I'll add another term here that we'll see. So fibers that cross over are said to be contralateral fibers. So only if they're crossing over, they're called contralateral. If they do not, we do not call them contralateral. I'll introduce you to the other term later on. Now, one of the most important fibers that work together and run together to form a tract. Remember, a tract is a bunch of axons or fibers inside of the CNS that you guys need to know about are called the pyramids. I'll spell it out for you. Or the, oops, that's kind of too thick. Um, the pyramidal, that was a highlighter. The pyramidal tracts or the pyramids. They're really well understood. They are motor fibers, meaning they leave the CNS, and the reason why we need to know a lot about them, or the reason why we'll discuss them more in the future, is because not only do they cross over, but they cross over at a very high point right nearby the junction of the brain with the spinal cord. So they're crossing over at the level of the 
what we call the medulla oblongata, which is the most inferior portion of the brain. So the pyramidal tracts cross over at the medulla oblongata. And they are tracts that are very much controlling our skeletal muscles. By the way, this is also already a nice introduction to show you what the spinal cord looks like. It looks like it has a little butterfly on the inside, and there's actually two halves to the spinal cord. So we talk about the hemisphere of the spinal cord as well, the hemispheres, I should say. So to continue our discussion of the different kinds of fibers, and this will be probably our last slide, remember we have fibers that stay within the same hemisphere. Those are association fibers. Then we have the fibers that run straight up and down between the spinal cord and the brain. We call those projection fibers, such as the pyramids. And then we have the fibers that interconnect your two cerebral hemispheres, or even in the spinal cord. And we call them commissures. There are two important commissures for you to know. You probably have heard of one of them already. The first one is called the corpus callosum, which is this big C-shaped piece of white matter right here. Remember, we're studying the white matter and lots of myelinated fibers. So this piece of white matter interconnects the left and the right hemisphere. And notice that in that, or I should say just inferior to that C-shaped structure, we have a smaller C-shaped structure that is also a commissure, and that's called the fornix. The fornix. The fornix plays an important role in relaying information about smell. 